All right, hello and welcome to another video. Uh, and today I'm going to be making a close to photorealistic payphone in Blender. Uh, but the first half of the video is mostly going to be in Photoshop. And I figured um, it's probably a good idea to kind of show the entire workflow for a model from start to finish. So what you can see right here is I have Photoshop open and I'm trying to create the textures for the payphone. I often find it uh, nicer to have the textures available before I start Blender because I find it kind of annoying to have to jump into Blender and then back to Photoshop and then back to Blender and then back to Photoshop. I'd rather just make all my 2D assets up front and then go into Blender and start making things. Uh, so what you see here is I'm making a bump map and what I did is I took a reference photo of a uh, payphone that I it wasn't perfectly straight on so I kind of used the uh, the skew tool in Photoshop to make it as square as I could you can see those blue rulers that I've uh, drug out as reference uh, but what I'm doing is I'm making a bump map and the way the bump maps work in 3d graphics is that they are a grayscale image and anything that's bright will be relief, right? It'll look like a bump on the surface and anything that's dark will look like it's uh, concavity. And so what I usually do is I use a middle gray. So, you know, there's uh, the grays go between zero and 255. So I make a middle gray, which is at 128, 128, 128 for the RGB values. And then anything that I want to look like it's lower than the surface, on the butt map, I make black or a dark gray. And anything that I want to make it look like it's sticking out a bit, I make white or a light gray. Um, so this used to be the way of making surfaced details before normal maps became popular. Now, normal maps are technically better because they give you slightly better fidelity over the way that light reflects off the surface. But it's a lot harder to make normal maps. And it's very, very easy to make bump maps in Photoshop. Those bump maps can be converted into normal maps. Of course, you don't get free resolution, <laughs> if it makes sense, um, by converting a bump map. A bump map converted into a normal map will pretty much look the same as a normal map. It'll just be in the PBR um, uh, pipeline. So right now I'm using bump maps. By the time I get these models ready for the game engine, they will be converted into normal maps. But uh, we're not going to go over that today. Today I'm just making the model. And once I have all my models, then I'll go in and convert them for the game engine. Uh, but what you could see I did right there is I took just a photograph of the keypad of a telephone. And I just used the magic wand tool to kind of get the background out of there. And then now I'm just dropping them over the graphic that I'm building. And at this point is a perfect point. You could see I just uh, very briefly there hid my reference photo and it's a solid middle gray 128 128 128 in the background and all the things that i want to look like they're going into the surface like they're you know etched into the surface are black so those numbers that i put on the keypad would look like they're sticking into the key um, the text for, uh, you can see for the coin door i kind of have those uh, ridges carved out along the edges and the push for coin is indented text for this panel i'm using a dark background but i'm using light around the keyhole you can see that that keyhole has a white outline around it that will actually look like it's sticking up above the surface right so it's relief so uh the cool thing about this uh, at least this project is that nothing has to be super 100 percent realistic i'm making this for a game it's a fictional phone company it's you know fictional everything so um, i can kind of make up some of the text as i go it doesn't have to be exactly the same as was on the reference photo uh, but when I used to work for Google and I was doing 3D modeling uh, professionally, uh, I, my goal was photorealism. And I would spend a lot of time making these textures look 100% identical um, so that on the final model they would look perfect. But because this is a game and I have the creative vision for it and the kind of creative control, uh, I can make up stuff as I go. So for example, I decided that Fountain Valley Telecom is the name of the phone company um, that operates this, this fictional phone. Uh, that's not a real uh, phone operator, at least if it is, uh, I didn't pick it on purpose. Um, but you know, this is probably going to be for this mall game that I talked about in previous episodes, where it's kind of like an 80s, 90s uh, retro aesthetic mall. Um, and so Fountain Valley just kind of seemed like a, a good name to fit with that. Um, but now these textures, obviously you can see I'm not using grayscale. I'm actually using color um, and, you know, the white and the blue and trying to make it look similar to what was on the payphone originally. 
and these these aren't going to be bump maps they're going to be actual textures so those are what will be called diffuse maps uh, but I think the the more preferred term these days is albedo or albedo I'm not sure uh, it sounds like libido but I think it's it's either albedo or albedo I'm not really sure how people prefer to say it but th these will basically be the color um, and so I'm doing both in the same file so that everything can kind of be kept to scale um, and I'm really just using basic Photoshop stuff you know um, I'm using layer groups which I think um, whenever I see a lot of amateur projects or people who don't use Photoshop that often usually they just have a ton of layers not organized in any particular order and then those layers um, don't have names and so I usually try to name my layers and sort them into groups that make sense so you can see on the right we have two top level groups one called texture and one called bump so we did the bump map first and now we're doing the texture and then as you can see I'm just using some basic um, shape tools to, to uh, try to recreate this phone logo um, again it doesn't have to be perfect because this is my fictional phone so if I were doing this professionally I would have probably got out Illustrator and tried to make you know a trace of the exact phone icon so that I could get it 100% perfect like the real thing but because this is my fictional phone company I can just kind of make it look how I want you know just get close but it doesn't have to be perfect because it's not based on real life of course I'm trying to make a phone that will look uh, as close to photorealistic as possible but um, you know I can take some liberties here or there <laughs> and here you see me trying to draw uh, a curve by hand using a mouse now I um, I have a drawing tablet a Wacom drawing tablet but I haven't used it in a while when I used to do 3d modeling work professionally I got into it and I used the Wacom all the time uh, but now that I'm an engineer full-time um, I, I kind of fell out of habit using the Wacom drawing tablet and now my hand feels super rusty whenever I try to use it so I don't use it that much anymore I'm gonna get one of those um, Huion tablets where you can actually see because uh, it's a screen you can actually see where you're drawing the whole thing with the Wacoms where it's like your hand is on the desk but you're looking at your monitor is really <laughs> really counterintuitive so uh, it definitely takes practice um, but I'm gonna get one of those eventually it's it's not a priority right now but all right so now we're going to start making the uh, texture for the side and the top of the phone. Um, so I'm just, you know, moving things around. And you'll see later on in the video the process of UV mapping these. And luckily, everything here is super straightforward to do UV mapping wise. Uh, one thing that a lot of people, especially beginners, are nervous about and don't know that much about is the UV mapping process. And actually, it's really easy. Um, when I started Blender, I knew nothing about UV mapping, but I could figure out just the basics enough to get what I wanted done. And just those basics are really simple. Um, if you want to do more complex UV unwraps for like character models or, or stuff like that, uh, there's definitely more things to keep in mind and to learn. Uh, but for this model, um, all the unwrapping is going to be very, very simple. So uh, here I'm making the logo now in the uh, original payphone. I don't know what that is that Packard Bell I don't, I don't know what that logo is but they use the asterisks um, the star uh, uh, graphic for their logo and so I figured I, I'd make it realistic but change it up a little bit I'd make it the pound sign um, <laughs> so still trying to make it look realistic but in my own fictional um, parody universe basically um, so I just make that logo and then I make a little red bar and you know with all creative things um, like you'll try things and they won't always work the first time and this is a perfect example of that I originally made the graphic for the phone small and now I needed it to be way bigger for the side of the phone and I tried a few different ways um, to try to, to sharpen it because it looks really blurry when I upscaled it and most of those ways failed you can see right here I'm trying a bunch of different ways at first I was like okay I'll just put the blue in there and make that look strong and then I'll just put a uh, a stroke around it to kind of smoothen out the edges uh, but then the smoke th the smoke <laughs> the stroke ended up looking bumpy and uh, it just didn't work the way I'd hoped so I bit the bullet and I decided to trace it and here's a cool uh, feature of Photoshop so what I'm doing here is I'm holding shift and every time you hold shift and you click it'll connect a line from where you previously clicked so it's a really fast way of tracing outlines if you don't want to have to use the curves. Um, I actually got into 
a bit of a race with one of my coworkers at uh, Google because she always used the pen tool and used curves to cut out objects. But I don't like doing it that way because you have to like adjust the curve and then grab the nodes and then move them and then grab the handles. And it's a very vector based approach and it just feels cumbersome because you have to constantly be tweaking those handles and, and everything. Um, but what I would do for selection is I would use the mask tool and I would just mask out the selection I wanted using the paintbrush. And because you can hold shift, um, you can trace objects with a paintbrush extremely quickly. You can do it way faster than you can do it with um, the uh, pen tool or vector graphics. Now, if I was working in Illustrator, obviously I would just use vector tools because I'm trying to make a vector graphic. But um, just by holding shift in Photoshop, you can, you can trace out curves very fast. And so you saw me do that around the outline of the phone there. But now we're finally in Blender. And no, the audio is not lagging. I'm just, my narration is still talking about Photoshop, but um, we're in Blender now. I'm dragging out the cube. Um, and this was a, a pretty simple um, process to make. There, there wasn't too much going on there. Uh, as you can see, I took my reference photo, dropped it in the front, and now I have another reference photo on the sidebar just so I can kind of see what I'm doing while I work. And again, nothing here is going to be like super um, like two millimeter precision scale. Uh, if I were doing you know, photorealistic work, I would actually have all the measurements and I would like look up the size and dimensions of the phone and so forth. Um, but because this is for my fictional universe, I just have to get close. And uh, that's what you see me doing here. I just extruded the outside or a little L shape around the outside of the phone to kind of give it that ridge where it would connect in real life. You can see that on the reference photo on the right, there's kind of that lumpy ridge that goes around the phone. Um, so just a couple, you know, uh, edge loops around the phone and then a couple extrusions and then a bevel to make it look nice and round. Of course at this point I cut it in half and I set up my mirror modifier because I only really want to be working on half the model at a time otherwise things get confusing. And <laughs> this was uh, you know one of those afterthoughts where I was like you know what I should actually try to make this the the vertices on the inside of this curve look a little bit more rounded so I was just scaling things in and I don't really remember <laughs> what I was in here. Okay, now we're making the, I believe, the front uh, panel um, that's kind of chrome and sticks out of the plastic. So just using a, another cube. And um, one thing to note about um, 3D modeling is that not all of your things have to be connected. There's kind of this, um, I, I guess, when you're a beginner, you think that every model should just be nothing but like a perfect continuous surface. But unless you're animating, uh, intersections are perfectly fine. And you're going to see that's what I'm doing here. So I just cut out the, the holes for the, the infographics on the, the front of the phone, uh, the different places where the little labels and stuff will go. Uh, and then I just put a bevel with the control B. And I'm sorry, I still forgot to turn on um, show keys in this. But right there, what you can see I did is I made the model and then I just pushed it back to intersect with the phone itself. So those are two separate models that are intersecting, and at some point I'll join them together to become one model. But that is a perfectly acceptable way to make a model, especially for a game engine, um, because it actually saves on triangles. Because if you were to try to make that one continuous surface, you'd have a bunch of geometry that's just there to support the connections, right? Because you have like a curve going into a plane, then you have a bunch of triangles to make that, that curve connection. But just by letting them intersect like this, um, it, it, it still renders fine. It still renders in a game engine just fine. Um, so I use intersecting geometry a lot. Um, the only downside is that the place where the intersection is will be perfectly sharp, right? Because you have a flat surface um, that's being intersect with another 3D object. And right where that intersection happens, uh, it'll be a perfect 90 degree angle or, or whatever, which is a little bit unrealistic. A lot of times you'd see some kind of uh, curve there or something. But um, for something like this, uh, especially for a game engine where it doesn't matter at all, <laughs> I'm not going to worry about that. And so intersection is, is more than, than fine. I just used uh, a bunch of different cubes there to make the buttons. And all of that will look a lot better once we start doing our materials. Um, but as you can see, we've, we've already knocked out like the basics framework of the phone so far. 
Here I'm making the little uh, receiver pickup using the mirror modifier. Um, I use skew a lot, which is a really cool tool in Blender, which if you're not using, you should probably use. Uh, I don't think there's a keyboard shortcut for it, but if you push F3 and you search shear or skew, I think it is, I think it's shear, it allows you to basically skew um, an object without changing its scale. Uh, you can rotate an object, but that technically makes it a little bit shorter, uh, where skew just allows you to add a slant to something um, uh, without having to do that. So uh, I use that to make those edges of the receiver angled without changing their height. Now I'm making a little mechanism for the coin return. And I, I probably fucked up there when I extruded because it extruded out at the uh, normal of the face of the... Um, uh, the, the round part um, when I really should have locked it to the x-axis so I had to go back and fix that a little bit but otherwise yeah we're just making that that part now time to make the handset um, so starting with a uh, looks like uh, wait what am I doing here <laughs> oh I see what I'm doing yeah yeah, yeah. so um, I started with a circle and turned it into like a tapered cone but I then used the grid fill option to fill the back of the circle. And if you're unfamiliar with the grid fill option, it's really awesome. Uh, but basically, if you select a, uh, a loop of vertices, and I think it has to be an even number of vertices, you'll get an error if there's an odd number. Uh, but if there's an even number of vertices, then you can select a loop of it and then press Control F for fill. And from the menu, choose grid fill. It might be Shift F, actually. Uh, but anyways, it, it, instead of filling it like a, a bunch of triangles going to one point, like you sometimes see, uh, it fills it with a grid, which is really handy, especially for modeling something like this handset, because then that grid can be turned into and extruded down to make the handle of the handset. So here I am just kind of messing around with the, um, the edges, because I want it to be... Um, subsurfed. I want to put a subsurf modifier on here to add more geometry and more roundness, but I want to preserve some of those edges um, and make them uh, look a little bit more rigid instead of just getting a completely, you know, uh, rounded, um, globular looking handset. And so there's a couple ways you can go about it. You can actually add more geometry. You can add bevels using the bevel operator, or you can select the edges and then choose, uh, I think it's edge weight, which when you put on the sub subsurf modifier, it doesn't affect those edges as strongly as other ones would. All right, and so now I'm going to use a curve to try to make the cable for the telephone. So I, I just want to have a kind of nice organic bend to it and make it look like it's one of those stiff wires that you'd see going into the phone. Um, and if I recall correctly, uh, I didn't do too good of a job. I came up with a curve that was okay-ish, but even after I finished, I still ended up tweaking it quite a lot. But that's fine because uh, using the proportional editing tool, you'll see later I make some adjustments to it. But uh, right now we're just using a curve, then I added another circle, and I set that to be the bevel object of the curve. And I think I set it to the taper object at first, and I meant bevel. Um, and now we have a perfectly basically extruded tube uh, in the shape of the curve and you can change the resolution settings on both the curve and on your circle object to create more or less geometry and even though I'm probably going to throw this into the new Unreal Engine I'm still trying to be somewhat conservative about geometry I know that new Unreal Engine is crazy and you can just have like infinity triangles basically <laughs> I'll, 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 tr I'll believe it when I see it, basically. It, it's still mind-blowing to me. Uh, but this, this project probably will end up in the Unreal Engine, and if that's the case, I don't really need to worry about triangles anymore. That's what they tell me. Uh, but it's a hard habit to break, so I'm still being pretty conservative with the number of triangles I used in this wire. Um, I probably already used more than would be acceptable for a traditional game engine. Uh, there's probably a few hundred triangles in that wire alone, which for a background prop, like why? You know, they, most engines probably you just use like a texture of a of a, a wire going to the phone or something, but um, or at least like a cube. But um, now it's finally time to start making some materials. Now it looks like I got all my geometry done. Uh, so the next step is to make materials, and that's usually the way that I work. I try to get my geometry done first 
and then I go in to make materials. I like to do one thing at a time. Like I said earlier, I like to have all my textures ready before I start Blender. Then I like to have my model ready before I start making materials. Um, so I can just like focus on one thing at a time. Uh, if you make something that looks perfect and then you texture it and then you make uh, materials for it, but your model's not done, then you have to go back to modeling and then work on that and then go back to texturing. And I feel like it's just faster this way. All right, so now we're just doing a simple UV unwrap. I did a project from view and you can see my bump map is really simple, but because I just projected it from the front, all I really have to do is just kind of move it around in 2D space. No uh, seams on this model, N no kind of uh, complex UV unwrapping. I literally just pointed the camera at the phone, said project from view, and now I'm aligning that texture uh, with the mesh that I made. Um, same thing with the buttons. I just do a project from view, and then I can go and line them up over their Photoshop texture. And what you'll see is really cool is because I used that um, the black for the colors of the letters, once I put that into the bump node of Blender and give it a metallic look, those will look like they're carved out of the surface. Um, I guess I made a mistake with my texture here. Oh, I didn't want the hole for the receiver anymore, so I got rid of that. Um, for this one, again, project from view and I just scaled it until the keyhole was the right size and same thing for this one just project from view and I tried to make it fit the uh, the texture I had prepared earlier. So now I'm finally wiring up some of the materials and you can see all of those like little um, uh, places where the texts were look like they're carved into the surface of the metal which is exactly the effect I was going for so I didn't have to um, you know, actually physically 3D model the text into the surface. Like a lot of people, especially if they're beginners, would try to do that. They would try to do like a Boolean with a text object to try to cut out the text from the model. But that's just gonna add a lot of geometry and uh, it'll make your geometry more ugly. You might introduce some artifacts. If you can use bump maps, use bump maps. <laughs> so um, all of the text and the little tiny details were just made in Photoshop um, and then Right now I'm adding a noise texture, which I usually use a lot of because noise textures make surfaces look imperfect or make them look imperfect and it's free. You know, it's built into Blender and it's just free detail that you can just get. So I'm just adding noise and I'm going to merge it in with a bump map that I already have so that the surface will look kind of rough and worn and textured and potted, um, but then also have the details that I designed in Photoshop as well. I just added a bunch of contrast there by using a color ramp and by dragging the color ramp really close to each other you can create high contrast noise uh, and there we go so now I'm starting to get that weathered kind of you know messed up look of the surface and I didn't have to do that in Photoshop or anything it was just a clever use of the the noise node along with a color ramp to create more contrast for the phone cable what I ended up doing is just applying the bezels and the um, the curve to turn it into a mesh. I think you just push F3 and you say mesh from curve slash uh, object. And now I just unwrap them uh, using the cylinder unwrap or the follow active quads unwrap. And now what I'm trying to do is create a texture with uh, just a color ramp, um, a repeating texture of a color ramp so that I can kind of create that um, segmented phone cord look. And you can see I just figured it out there. So it's basically just a gradient where it's black and then it kind of tapers off to white. And that's what I used for the color and for the bump map of the cable. So didn't even have to make a texture for this one, just did it entirely using uh, a color ramp and I repeated it in UV space. Uh, so now I'm just making a quick little rubber bumper for the bottom of the phone handset and the cable is looking good. I still have to make the connector for um, where the cable goes into the phone, but I guess I got distracted and uh, uh, I guess now I'm making the labels and these are just planes, just added a quad. Um, and then now the cool thing is, is I have all those, I can unwrap, project from view, switch my other texture, and all I have to do is move those quads. And so that's what I was talking about where I was like, um, Nothing in this project is difficult UV unwrapping because it's literally just um, 
projecting from view straight on from the camera's angle and then moving it in UV space over the correct part of the texture. So all very easy stuff to do. Here's our Fountain Valley phone label. Again, just project from view and, and align the textures in 2D space. Very, very easy stuff. Same thing for this part as well. Now those are all one material called phone labels. So what I'm gonna do is add, you guessed it, a noise texture and use that as a bump map because no, per no surface in real life is perfectly smooth. So I always use a bump map. Sometimes I use a moose grave texture as well instead of noise, but um, oh yeah, now I finally remember to make the connection for the cable. But yeah, I just always add noise a noise bump map to most of my materials just because it gives them a little bit of extra flavor <laughs> and just makes them look better. It's like it's like the salt of, of texturing. Like you could make very boring looking textures in Photoshop. Like if you look at the, the UV space, um, uh, now I'm finally going back and correcting the, the cable with the proportional editing tool. But if you look at the UV space, like that's a very boring, flat, ugly texture in Photoshop. But I just add a little bit of noise to the surface of it and now it looks like a plastic label uh, once you get it in um, in Blender. So I just always add noise to everything. Uh, just It just makes it look more rich uh, like the world actually is because in, in the world things do look ugly and have imperfections all over their surfaces. So um, now I'm making the box that goes around the phone. I just started with a cube. I used bevel on for the corners, use the mouse wheel to scroll up and get extra extra segments in that. And now I'm adding some uh, cuts around the edge. I have to use the knife tool because you can't do a loop cut with an end gone. And because beveling does create end gones, I had to use the knife tool, but now I'm just extruding that back and creating a little platform for the phone to sit on. But this is all uh, pretty basic modeling stuff. Um, you know, I had to, uh, or I'm sorry, <laughs> I had to uh, put on um, uh, Shade Smooth and then go into the uh, UV section to turn on Auto Smooth so that it doesn't try to smooth around the hard edges, but um, nothing particularly interesting going on um, in this segment, uh, just making that phone box uh, look nice. I guess I decided after the fact that my corners were a little bit too rounded, so uh, that's a trick you can see what I did there. I just scaled them on median point using median point mode scaling uh, separately vertically uh, so I did the top two vertically the bottom two vertically and then I did the left two horizontally and then the right two horizontally and that allowed me to scale all four corners down without distorting the entire shape could have probably also done that with individual origins but um, I, I don't think I could have selected it that easily all right now we're finally using that texture for the side of the phone. And for this, I just did the same thing. I went to the side view, and again, I did a project from view. And that's the great thing about project from view for doing UVs, is that you don't have to understand anything about UV unwrapping. Uh, you can literally just line up the surface on the model with the camera and do project from view for the faces you have selected and then they'll be in 2D space and you can just move them around in 2D space. It is by far the easiest way to do UV unwrapping because it doesn't take any thought. You literally just point the camera at the face you want, project from view, and now you have those faces in 2D. So this entire model, like it ended up looking pretty good. I'm pretty happy with how this model came out and not a single thing had any kind of advanced UV unwrapping. It was all project from view. Uh, which will get you surprisingly far. Um, so whenever people are worried about um, like learning UV unwrapping or whatever, uh, I always just want to tell them, you know, start with projection view. That's by far the easiest to pick up. And then from there, you, you can make surprisingly good models with projection view. And then from there, you can work on other techniques using seams and the different other UV unwrapping options. But for now, like a model like this, I I'm not going to do any more work than I have to do. So I'll just do project from view for this. And I should also mention that um, before this gets into a game engine, I will do a proper unwrap um, for the PBR textures. 
But because I'm not doing that today and I just want to get the model done, I'm not doing that. But uh, for the actual game engine, uh, I'll probably want to bake ambient occlusion, which means I'll have to have a better unwrap. Uh, but I'll probably do a video on that someday separately, just all about unwrapping um, and, and preparing models from Blender for a game engine. Uh, but that was not the point of this video today or making this model. So I'm using Cycles. I still really like Cycles. EV is great. I work in EV. I do all my previews and material in, in EV. But my final renders, I still always do in Cycles um, because it just looks so much better. You can get really close in EV, but I'd rather just <laughs> like you can get really close doing materialing and texturing and rendering in EV, but you have to like tweak the settings a lot and yeah, you'll save time on a render, but you'll spend all that time tweaking settings. I'd rather just set up a light, press F12, and let Cycles do its thing and get a perfect render because I don't have to be there for that. I can like tell my computer to render and then I can go for a walk and then five minutes later it's ready or you know whatever like i can do other stuff i could watch youtube while cycles is rendering whereas with ev you kind of have to do a lot of prep work to get the 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 lighting and the the, the shadows and the ambient occlusion and the screen space reflections and all that sort of stuff set up correctly um that you have to be there at the computer for you have to be doing those things i'd rather just press f12 let cycles do its thing and then walk away and come back and have it look good um, so I still really like cycles. The only thing I use EV for is animations because unless I want to pay for a render farm, um, animations take up a lot of time. I did pay for a cycles render farm for one of my projects, but most of the time when I'm doing animations, I'll take the time to, uh, prepare EV because then it'll save me time, right? Because it's crazy. Like you can do a thousand frames of an animation in like a half hour or something with EV. So I uh, do animations in EV because at that point it's worth it to invest your time perfecting the rendering. Uh, but for a single render like this, um, I just use cycles. Anyways, I think we're uh, almost there. Um, as you can see, here we have the final telephone model. And I am really happy with how this came out for uh, a relatively short amount of time. That was about two hours. I started at 622 and I finished at 8.18, so almost exactly two hours from having nothing and starting in Photoshop to what you see here, um, a pretty decent phone model. I did actually go in and tweak the, the materials on this a little bit after my video recording, so it does look a little bit better now. Um, I, I noticed that some of the noise that I put on there was a little bit too strong, so I toned that down a bit. I noticed that the material on the actual uh, payphone shell was looking a little bit too plasticky, so I kind of fixed that and made it look more like painted metal. Uh, but for the most part, uh, it didn't change too far from this. And that is how you make a payphone in Blender in two hours, or if you're watching this video, in about 30 minutes.